Yeah, Tyler, uh, my question is for you, Micah Scheib and Nessa Goddard. Um, have you thought at all about mechanisms to capture the uh, escaping water? Yeah, so uh, the general premise I think we're looking at is to have sort of a cold trap tent that would be sitting over this, uh, the indirect soil receiver, something that we can have the light, you know, optically pass through, but just allows the sublimation to be trapped and harvested. Another question for you, Tyler. Uh, I'm Zach Vig, University of Maryland. Um, so you said 35 suns and 85 suns, and I personally don't know what that means, like physically. Like, what, what, like in terms of like mirrors on the rim of a crater, like what does that actually look like in terms of capturing that energy? Yeah, so one sun is the uh, amount of radiation pretty much that you get for one meter squared standing outside. Uh, and your body is approximately a meter squared in frontal area. So if you're standing outside uh, sunbathing, that's one sun. Uh, and so we're trying to get uh, for these experiments, 35 to 85 suns. Um, and for these mirrors, we don't, I don't know the exact number off the top of my head of how many we'd need, but it, for these uh, on the moon with the low attenuation of the atmosphere, because there is no atmosphere and longer daylight times, we wouldn't need more than a dozen or so mirrors as a rough estimate to set up on the, the rims. A uh, question, uh, Clive Neal, University of Notre Dame. Question for Alex. Prospecting. Yeah. Um, you're using geophysical prospecting methods. Mm -hmm. um, and how are you going to you know, translate what you've learned in the field here to doing it on the moon? Is that the right seismometer for it? Or is that going to work? Or what, what modifications would you need to be doing this in situ, so to speak? Yeah, so um, based on the field work that we have done, we could actually, uh, you know, um, figure this out where the reflectors are, I think, from like the the area that it can cover uh, with that kind of many nodes or geodes that we have deployed uh, that will work. Um, you know, some of that will be tested on a future flight mission if this kind of passive network will actually pick up things and can detect ice on the moon. Um, and then the lesson from that will be how to, you know, go forward with this and implement that into a larger strategy to look for resources. So I think we're at the beginning of that um, and then um, see how that pans out to formulate how to implement that on, on the lunar surface. That's okay. what I would say. Right. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. If no one else has questions for the moment, I have a question for Connor. So um, earlier this morning, um, perhaps you were there, we saw an interesting talk about for cold spots on the moon, how the um, microregolith layer can help that those areas propagate without necessarily disturbing the surface. How would that work in those sort of simulations work either in parallel or be complementary to the simulations that you're running? Um... So it's, there's a lot of overlap for sure. You know, it's just for the simulations that I uh, present on here, it's more of just having the model of how the regolith really is and the topography, you know, and then the thermodynamics kind of take care of the rest there. So, you know, they kind of go hand in hand where so long as, you know, we're, we're both in agreement on the base facts of of how the topography and, and the regolith behaves and exists, then you know we can start to compare results in some degree. Very cool. I'll ask a question of Tyler. Um, now, Tyler, I want to preface this with the fact that I'm not an engineer; I'm a <laughs> geologist. So, you know, few small words with a lot of pictures. In your explanation, please. Um, you showed you showed three plots on a slide, and you had a tie line between them, and they seemed to be one seemed to be higher than the other, and then you had the uncertainties there, and they're within uncertainty. Um, how can that then show a trend? You said all oh, these show a trend, and I'm I'm thinking I missed something. So can you? Yeah, no, certainly. So that's why we're saying that for the indirect solar receiver, the inclusion knot that showed. Uh, with decent certainty that there is statistical significance to say uh, there is a trend or interaction, as we'd say. So having an indirect soil receiver increased sublimation. 
For the porosity, it is not as certain. Like I said, the confidence intervals kind of overlap. Um, and same thing with the, the changes in the solar flux. Um, the reason for that is we only have, we have about eight or so experiments at the low sun uh, level, but only two experiments at the high sun level because I keep breaking stuff. Um, that's what we're only running for 30 minutes. So we're still in the middle of running these data and hopefully when we get more data, we'll have much stronger statistical significance yeah. to show the, which factors are more critical in the sublimation. Okay. All right. Thank you. Good explanation. I understood it. <laughs> we have a couple more minutes and that would still allow for a break. So I'm going to ask a question of Tyler as well. Um, so my question is what does ultra high vacuum mean to you in the context of this work. Um, but specifically, I'm asking from the lens, um, thinking of a question that was asked again earlier uh, today of, um, you know, 10 to the minus four, I think was the example is still in a lot of contexts, a, a not very high vacuum in terms of you're going to see um, water, other, you know, components of the atmosphere out here on earth. And so I'm wondering if you're looking at water and how that's freezing, yeah. how, how would your vacuum level play into that? Yeah, so we're actually sitting at, uh, on a good day, 10 to negative 7 uh, tor for our range. So we are getting towards the ultra vacuum. Um, it's a challenge in some of these setups, and it took a long time to figure out how to get there because as we're, we have a, a huge mass, we probably have 30 grams of water, 500 grams of material. And so as we're trying to freeze and pull vacuum, we're constantly sublimating. And so we have to fight with that. Um, and so during these experiments, we, we should be at a good enough vacuum that we don't have to worry about refreezing um, once we're sublimating because it gets hot pretty fast. Um, but that's something, again, that's one of the biggest challenges that has come up with this research. What kind of vacuum pumps do you use? Uh, we have molecular ion vacuum pumps. Uh, we have two of them because we have two separate chambers. Uh, so we have the main chamber where the sublimation takes place, and then we have a pinhole separator for a second chamber that contains a second uh, molecular ion pump and the uh, mass spectrometer. Uh, and then those are both in series with a scroll pump uh, that goes out to our desiccant trap. I'm jealous. Very cool. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. We have time for maybe one more question. Um, otherwise, I'm not seeing anything online or in the room. So feel free to take a little bit of a break before I believe the next thing starts up at three in this room. Thank you. <laughs> 